Hello, Internet. It is I, Malik Aaron Aaron, and welcome back to Box Office Recap. So, this is part three of my summer 2023 recap. Part one went over the non-losers. Part two went over the small losers slash mediocre performers. And in this video, we're going over all the big losers, the expensive losers. So, in other words, part one was the good. Part two was the bad. And part three is the ugly because man, summer had some absolute disasters. Like God, like like looking back, it's really hard to believe that some of these movies did as poorly as they did. Like it's crazy. Like summer as a whole just kind of felt like a weird fever dream where like right was left, up was down. Like things happened that just did not make sense. Really. <laughs> At least, you know, going into it, like, it was wild. So, let's begin, shall we? So, we all we got to go all the way to May 19th to get our first movie, and that movie is Fast X. So, with Fast X, the 10th Fast and the Furious movie, or the 11th, if you count Hobbs and Shaw. This movie didn't do that good. I thought it would do a lot better. Mainly because this movie was in a healthier position than F9. Because, you know, looking at the whole history of Fast and Furious. The last movie, F9. Uh, if it pops up. Okay, this movie had to deal with several issues. One, COVID. It was one of the first victims of it. Got delayed by like a whole year. It's supposed to come out in 2020. And like when it did come out, it had to deal with a very weird environment where the box office was really trying to come to go back to normalcy. It was trying really hard. And it was kind of happening, but not at the same time. And then there's also the whole John Cena Taiwan thing that happened too so this movie had a lot going against it but it still made money at the end of the day so obviously there was going to be a 10th movie or a 10th mainline movie but like fast x it didn't have to deal with really any of that like it came out well it was supposed to come out like i believe in 2021 that was the initial plan before you know covid ruined everything well fast x it didn't have to deal with like covid related issues like like, hard COVID-related issues. Like, the marketplace was back. Like, we had, like, several billion-dollar movies, like, in the last two years. You know, No Way Home, Top Gun Maverick, Avatar The Way of Water, um, you know, the Super Mario Brothers movie. Like, we've had hits. We've had big hits. So, you know, this movie didn't have to do with any, like, ex uh, external circumstances. But even still, it did worse than F9, especially domestically, because this movie opened with like 67 million, which was like a bit lower than F9. But I looked at that number, I was like, you know, that's not too bad. But then its legs were rough. Even by Fast and the Furious standards, they were rough. This movie did not have a long life. It fell like 66% the next weekend, and then 58, then 45, then 60. You see, it's, it's an ugly picture. It didn't even make it to like 150. I thought it would at least do that, but it only made it to like 145, which is on the lower end of the series, only higher than the first three Fast and the Furious movies. And when it comes to actual ticket sales, I'm pretty sure it's the second worst behind Tokyo Drift, which is real bad. And what's even more embarrassing is that Fast X is of domestic total was less than what Furious 7 opened with. So Furious 7 more, made more in three days than Fast X made total. Yeah, that's no good. And it's pretty obvious that the series peaked with Furious 7. Like Many would argue it should have ended at Furious 7, but Universal, they couldn't let that happen. Like They got to squeeze more money out of Fast and Furious. And it worked for a little bit, you know, Fate of the Furious made a billion dollars. Hell, it didn't even need the U.S. to make a billion dollars. Then Hobbs and Shaw, you know, for a spinoff, it did okay. Not great, but fine. Then F9, considering 
you know the circumstances did all right too but fast x there's no there's no excuse for this especially look at the budget 340 million dollars that's his production budget that's not even including marketing cost like this movie needed to make a billion just to even be remotely successful and it could even it wasn't even close to that so yeah ugh. It's like this these numbers clearly show that only core fans are showing up to these movies and even then like they're they're bleeding out <laughs> like those core fans are they like as you can see going back real quick you can see a very clear dip after furious 7 and even like fate of the furious like a there's a very steep decline here. So, you know, like only core fans care. Most people have just like um, moved on. They're just like, you know what? I'm done with the ride. I'm done with like this series. And they kind of dropped off. I didn't. <laughs> I watched this movie. It was very dumb. Very stupid. But I expected it to be very stupid. But, yeah. Ugh. I mean, we know Fast and Furious 11 or Fast 11, whatever it's going to be called. It's coming out in like two years, you know, supposedly. I don't think it would have been affected because, you know, the writer strike is now over. There's still the actor strike to deal with, but the movie probably wouldn't have film started filming until like 2024 anyway. So I don't think it would have been affected at all by the strikes. But that's supposed to be like the end of the series although i've heard rumblings of like a 12th movie but after fast x after this box office where it barely doubled its budget i would have 11 be the end have 11 do 11 and then stop for good because you don't want to risk being an actual bomb a hard bomb you don't want to risk that so yeah i would say just make fast and furious 11 and just have that be the end of the series because this is supposed to be like the beginning of the end. And, you know, that's like kind of like what the marketing was like pushing. So, you know, hopefully Fast 11 is it. But, I mean, that movie might do better. I mean, The Rock is back as Luke Hobbs. He's back in the franchise. It seems like, you know, him and Vin, you know, they had their differences. They had their little clash. <laughs> had their uh, problems but it seems like they've broke bread and now are willing to work with each other again so maybe maybe he maybe the rock's a secret ingredient to making these movies you know make a billion dollars again because the last fast and furious movie to make a billion had him in it and the other and sure there's Hobbs and shaw but that's a spinoff of f9 didn't have him fast x well he was in the very end as a post credit in the post credit scene but he wasn't like in the marketing or anything. And that didn't help Fast X's box office. So maybe Fast 11 will do better. But yeah, Fast X, I would call it a loser. A big loser. It's not the biggest bomb of the summer. Oh God, no, it's not that. But I wouldn't call it a hit at all. <laughs> so yeah. So that was Fast X. Now we move on to The Little Mermaid. This one is a little more weird because its domestic numbers are actually pretty good, all things considered. I mean, it opened with like 95 million, made like almost 300 million uh, domestically. I believe the only movies this year that have done better are Barbie, the Mario movie, Across the Spider Verse, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, and Oppenheimer. And that's it. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. So this will definitely be in the top 10 of the year, you know, domestically, for sure. But the problem is, is it's overseas numbers. Just overseas numbers were terrible. Killed, they killed any chance of this movie making a profit in theaters. Because, you know, this international box office was less than its domestic box office, which is not a good sign. Especially, which is especially not good considering this movie cost $250 million dollars. Only made like five hundred and sixty nine million worldwide, just like barely doubling its budget. That doesn't even include marketing. So that's not great at all. <laughs> and compared to other Disney live action remakes, 
you know, we've gotten. It doesn't look good there either. So let's look at those. I'm only going to uh, do like the the Disney remakes that were of the Di uh, Disney Renaissance, which funny enough started with the original Little Mermaid and ended with uh, Tarzan. So the main ones they've done are the Lion King. I know that. Lion King, Aladdin, and I have to find Beauty and the Beast. I have to find that one. Beauty and Oops. The Beast. There we go. Yeah, like it's worldwide it's not even like half as much. I mean Beauty and the Beast, uh one point two, Aladdin a, a billion, Lion King one point six. Internationally, it's an absolute joke compared to these movies. Like, look at these numbers. It's pathetic. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, oof. yeah. So, what went wrong here, exactly? Well, this movie got a lot of online talk about, oh my gosh, they made Ariel black, <laughs> basically. That was like a lot of the talk around it and it ugh, I remember it all it was really obnoxious and then like they changed like some of the songs and I, I did not care I kind of tuned it all out because I wasn't going to watch this movie anyway because I I just didn't care like it wasn't because I was like vehemently against it I just didn't care I never watched the original so I have no reason to watch the remake when I know for a fact the remake is going to automatically be worse than the original so why watch it, right? And I didn't. So, yeah, like, there's all that online talk. I thought that talk would lead to this movie doing worse. That apparently the, the reported reason why the international numbers were so bleh, were so bad, was but that some, you know, I guess some countries weren't like too keen on Ariel being black apparently and that's resulted in like really poor numbers but I mean like I mean looking at the box office like I've been looking at the box office for years years and years and there's definitely a trend like where movies to have like say black leads like they don't do as well overseas as they do domestic like there are too many examples of that. But that doesn't mean they can't do well internationally. Black Panther, for example, made $700 million in the States, but still made $600 million internationally, which is more than what this movie made total. And, you know, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, sure, that did, like, way worse, but it still made over $800 million. It did way better internationally than, like, The Little Mermaid. So, I don't know. I don't know, maybe there's also the fact that people have really turned on Disney, like in especially the live action remakes. A lot of people are really sick of these remakes. I'm one of those people because I think they may describe them as lazy and soulless and it just feels very creatively bankrupt. <laughs> and you know, it seems like people are just like, you know what? Nah, I don't want to watch that. <laughs> So, like, I'm crossing my fingers that Disney really stops with these remakes because I feel like it's really killing their legacy, if you ask me. But I know they're not going to stop. They can't help it. It's like they're addicted and they don't want to go to rehab at all. Like, they just want to just keep on going. I mean, next year we have the Snow White movie, which already has a ton of controversy surrounding it. And apparently that movie is, like, stupid expensive, too, like $300 million, which you have to be on some serious drugs to think that spending $300 million on a Snow White movie is a good idea. <laughs> like, it's... Ugh. Like, it, it, it's bad. So, yeah, The Little Mermaid, I would call it a flop. At least, you know, domestically, it did fine. Internationally, bomb. <laughs> and as a result, the movie, I can't call it a success at all. So, yeah, and this isn't even, like, 
and it's also the fact that you know Disney wanted way more out of this. You know they envisioned this as a billion dollar movie. You know it. And this didn't get anywhere close to that. So that's another reason why I'm putting... I've I've made the movie like a big loser. The reason why I classify it as such. So that's the end of May. Now we go to June. We have three... Wait, one, three... Three movies to talk about. The first being Transformers Rise of the Beast. All right. This movie... Okay, so I had low expectations for it, you know, fin- uh, at the box office. Like, I thought it would do awful because I wasn't feeling, like, any hype surrounding this movie. I mean, it's also, which is mainly because, like, the Transformer movies, like, they clearly peaked a long time ago. Like, the first three movies, like, like look at this, 700, 800, 1.1 billion like Dark Moon reaching like 352 million domestic and Red Revenge of the Sith 400, the first Transformers movie 300. So like the series peaked with the first three movies financially. And then he made 4, which did quite a bit worse domestically but did more than enough overseas to like justify its existence, making a billion. The only 2014 movie to do so. So they're like, "Well, let's keep going." And they made Transformers the last night. And at the, that point, audiences had enough. They abandoned ship. They were done. And you can clearly see that with the box office. Because it only made like $130 million domestic. $600 million worldwide. It lost quite a bit of money. So, ugh. And then a year later, you had Bumblebee. Which did worse. But the thing is, it cost way less. So... I mean, it's like, it wasn't like a total bust. It did well. But Bumblebee wasn't exactly like a movie that people were like, damn, we get, we need more of this. There was no real, you know, I guess that post-release hype, I guess. Like, like Into the Spider-Verse, which came out the same month as Bumblebee, a week before Bumblebee, that had post-release buzz. Like, that built an audience over time, which led to the sequel getting a ton of hype out from the get-go and having the sequel across the Spider-Verse make as much money as it did. Bumblebee never had that. <laughs> so, Rise of the Beast was kind of in a bad spot because of that. So, I thought it would open, like, what, 30, 40 million? I was expecting really bad numbers. But it opened much bigger than that, 61 million. I'm like, okay... There may be some life in this franchise. It's not a total loss. Then it fell 66%. And I'm like, oh no. (laughs) Well, so much for that. But it did recover from that. And it made like 153... uh, Not 153. 157 million domestic. Which is better than the last two Transformers movies. Those movies being Bumblebee and The Last Knight. But here's the problem. It did worse internationally than those movies. And it's the lowest grossing Transformers movie out of all the live action ones. And it's on a budget of almost 200 million. So it barely doubled its budget, which is uh, (laughs) like barely just got over like uh, a multiplier of two. And, you know, the marketing cost was like big for this. So uh, cannot I cannot call this a winner, just like. Uh, Fast X and Little Mermaid can't call this a winner. I I can't. I can't. It's it's a loser. And you know, I know there's supposed to be a Transformers movie next year, but it's animated. It's called Transformers One, and they want to do more sequels to this. But is it worth it? Like, do you want to keep going? Like, if you're gonna get diminishing returns, like, do you really want to keep going? I mean, if you spend less money on it, then like. Sure, I guess you can keep going, but I don't know. I feel like Transformers is kind of played out, just like Fast and the Furious. I think people are just kind of yawning at the prospect of another um, movie in the series. So, yeah. So, Rise of the Beast, it wasn't a complete bomb, but I'm not calling it a hit at all. I I can't. (laughs) So, yeah, uh... 
Trying to wait for this, ugh, this stupid thing. Okay. So that's it for Transformers. But, you know, with Transformers and Little Mermaid and Fast X, they at least doubled their budgets. Which is something I cannot say for our next movie. The Flash. Dear God, The Flash. Um, This has been classified as one of the biggest bombs ever. It lost apparently $200 million. And there's so many reasons why. I don't want to go on and on about it. I've talked about this movie ad nauseum. But I'll give you the cliff notes. Like the main reasons why this movie failed as hard as it did. So, first of all, it's part of the DCEU. And the DCEU, as you know, is pretty much dead at this point. I mean, it was already rocky for a long time of, you know, with it never hitting, like, high expectations of, like, being a true rival to the MCU. It was never able to really do that because they made so many bad choices and bad decisions, and they never could, it never had a, uh, they just never had a, I'm losing my train of thought. Like, the vision they had. They never had a clear vision. They went in so many different directions that it was impossible to figure out what the hell was going on. <laughs> and then, like, the the nail in the coffin was that last year they were like, you know what? James Gunn, Peter Saffron, they're going to make a new DC Universe. And when they announced that, that pretty much made every DCU movie after that irrelevant. Automatically. None of them mattered. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's like the first problem, the DCU brand. Second problem was uh, Ezra Miller, you know, The Flash. And Ezra Miller, ugh. First of all, the thing is, I never liked Ezra Miller's Flash to begin with. I thought they just didn't... Something felt very off about Ezra's Flash. Like, I only seen Ezra's Flash in, like, Justice League. But in Justice League, man, like Ezra was so damn annoying and I just wanted them to go away. And you never want a, a character to go away. When when you want a character to go away, then that's it. <laughs> like, it, it's just over at that point. And so, say like a whole movie with Ezra Miller's Flash, I was not looking forward to it. But that's just like a, in the movies. Like in real life, Ezra is an absolute menace. I mean, we've all seeing like what happened last year with all the arrest and allegations and criminal activity it's a lot and i and because of all that it maybe just straight up boycott this movie like i refuse to watch it period because of that because i don't want to support a movie where the the main actor is just a true piece of shit i don't want to do that <laughs> like it's it's one thing to be like, just a douchebag. It's another thing to be a criminal. <laughs> okay. Uh, and to potentially be maybe a groomer. That's like, that's like some of the allegations out there. So, yeah, I was, I was not about to go anywhere near that. So, yeah. So, Ezra Miller's reputation. That's like another thing that caused this movie to tank. And there's also the fact that, like... <sighs> D, like Warner Brothers were like they were clearly desperate with this movie because they kept like hyping it up so much to a degree where I I just didn't trust anything they were saying they were like oh this is the greatest superhero movie of all time and this and that like they had like people outside of the superhero movie genre like Stephen King like rave about it for some reason like I just like it's just clear like they really really wanted this to be a hit they weren't like if they were really confident they didn't need to do that they would have just let the movie just speak for itself like but like all this weird hype it just kind of turned me off it just made me go yeah this isn't this isn't going to be a great movie is it <laughs> and then let's see what else i guess like the 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 fact that the movie looked kind of it felt like a no way home ripoff i know it wasn't meant to be that way but that's just the way it ended up looking because of the whole multiverse aspect of this movie 
like with No Way Home, you had like MCU Peter, then you had, you know, Toby and Andrew, I guess, you know, Tom, you know, Tom's Peter. And, you know, the whole game with that movie is that, oh, Toby and Andrew are in this movie. Like, we all know they were, we all knew they were going to be in the movie, but they were, they didn't want to show us at all, even though we all knew it. So I just, you know, just the fact that they weren't showing them at all, and they were like very much denying it when we all know they were lying. It made people so hyped, hyped out of their minds to see that movie. Like the hype train for that movie was probably one of the biggest I've ever seen out of any movie. And as a result, the movie was a enormous success. It basically saved the movie theater industry. But with The Flash, they did the polar opposite. They were just like, here's Michael Keaton's Batman. Here he is. And most of the advertising, which I thought was weird. I was just like, you know, there's a lot of Batman. They're really pushing Batman in a movie called The Flash. Kind of odd, don't you think? <laughs> and, you know, Michael Keaton Batman has plenty of fans. I, I know that. I literally read, like, I remember going watching the first trailer. And I went through the comment section. And literally every single comment was about Ben uh, Michael Keaton's Batman, people being hyped up about that. But apparently all that hype turned out to just be, I think it was described as like hot air. Like that hype did not lead to strong ticket sales. Like that hype kind of like died out after a while. People got over it real quick, which wouldn't have happened if you didn't market a movie that way. If you hid Michael Keaton's Batman and you... And they revealed them in the actual movie. I feel like people would be would have been way more hyped for it. Or he just didn't show him at all. Maybe show teases. But don't show him. Like in the trailers. Why? I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. Well, I know why they did it. Because they didn't want to advertise Ezra Miller. For obvious reasons. But yeah, just like... I guess the marketing as a whole just didn't work. And then, like, the movie itself had, like, a lots of issues from what I've heard and what I've seen from, like, clips. There is, like, the whole, you know, the CGI was real wonky as hell. Like, it looked just terrible considering the budget for the movie. And then there's the fact that they recreated, like, dead actors for cameos, like Christopher Reeve and Adam West, and people found that gross and disgusting, rightfully so, and, yeah, that, 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 that's, I thought that was real icky, and, yeah, so there's a lot of reasons why this movie failed as hard as it did, and there's also the fact that it took so long for this movie to get made, like, I remember so many, like, directors, like, coming in, and then coming out, they just they're they like in and out. And I'm like, why is it so hard to make a flash movie? It's a guy who runs fast. Why is that so difficult? Like I so I thought so this project was basically cursed from the get-go. But then it's box office. God damn. This movie initially was expected to make like a hundred million opening weekend, like initially, like a few months in advance. But then as the movie got closer to release, those projections dropped. To like 80, then 70, then 60. But they weren't low enough apparently because open was like 55 million, which is awful for a movie that was supposed to be the hit of the summer, like what Warner Brothers wanted it to be. Like 55 million, that's less than the first Ant Man movie. That's less than the freaking. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other movies. Like, that's no better than, like, the first Shazam. That's no better than uh, Batman Forever from 1995. You know, the first, you know, the post-Michael Keaton, the first, you know, the the first non-Michael Keaton Batman movie we got. You know, he was impressed by Val Kilmer. Like, this number is embarrassing. So embarrassing. And then only got worse way worse it fell 72 percent week two which is one of the worst drops ever for a superhero movie the only ones i believe did worse were i know there was morbius that was 74 percent and i think steel that was 78 percent with shaquille o'neal i think those are the only ones that did worse i'm not sure about dark phoenix it may be tied with that i'm not sure but yeah 72 percent drop that is just 
<laughs> there's no words to describe it really and then it just fell and fell and plummeted until it was gone by the end of july and just looking at his daily box office i knew things were gonna go bad because i had like its preview number was was way lower than expected. It was like way worse than like across the Spider Verse and Guardians Three, which were like seventeen million. Then twenty four million opening day. I was like, uh oh, this is worse than Black Adam. <laughs> and Black Adam wasn't even a hit. <laughs> and then that fell thirty six percent Friday Saturday. That one percent was only because of Father's Day. That's if it, if I, if it wasn't Father's Day, it would have. I don't think it would have made fifty million opening weekend. And then just look at this. 81% Friday to Friday. It, uh, it's so bad. It didn't even double its opening weekend. It had the same numbers as Watchmen. <laughs> Basically, Watchmen legs. Which is very much not a good thing. Because, you know, while I really like Watchmen, I really like that movie, it's clear that that movie... Yeah, it divided people. You know, people were... Some people were just not into it, or they just couldn't get into it. And The Flash, it was supposed to be way more mainstream, way more mainstream friendly, and didn't help it at all. Um, only made like two hundred sixty-seven million dem- worldwide on a budget of two hundred million. That is just so anemic. Like I thought this would have made like six hundred million at least. It didn't even get half. It didn't make half as much as that. So. Yeah, The Flash, like, this is the big L of the summer, easily, because, like, this was being, this was obviously, as I mentioned, it was positioned, Warner Brothers tried really hard to make this the big movie of the summer, and it, it did not happen, it refused to happen, and I'm really glad it didn't happen, because this movie didn't deserve to succeed, so, I'm actually, so I was very satisfied, I was laughing at its grave the whole time, <laughs> and... I I would be shocked if we saw Ezra Miller's Flash ever again in like in DC movies. I think this this is it. There you would have to be insane to keep Ezra Miller around. Like it it wouldn't make sense. It just would not make sense. So yeah, so that was the Flash, the big disaster, the biggest disaster of summer. But that's not all. Mm. There's one more big disaster of summer that came out. Well, another big disaster of summer that came out the same month, two weeks later. And actually, might as well mention Elemental. It. I still think it is incredible how this that movie avoided being a part of this video. Because that movie should have been a part of this video. I should have been talking about it in detail in this video. But that movie managed to save itself. The Flash couldn't do that at all. And the fact that Elemental made more than The Flash is bonkers. It it's <laughs> it, it's it really shows you just how insane the summer box office was. Because I never would have guessed this in a million years. Never. I thought the Flash would have made like two hundred well over two hundred million domestic, but nah, it barely got past a hundred million. <laughs> so yeah yeah so that was the flash and now we move on to indiana jones and the dial of destiny Oof, boy this thing okay so there are plenty of reasons why this failed just like the flash there's the fact that the last indiana jones movie we got kingdom of the crystal skull wasn't that great that movie had a ton of hype surrounding it did not live up to expectations. It was mocked and memed relentlessly <laughs> for years because with the whole uh, nuking the fridge thing. So this movie, Indiana Jones 5, it had to deal with the previous movie's baggage. So that was like the first problem. The second problem is that Lucasfilm, oh man, their reputation has really sunk Like ever since like Disney bought them. I mean, it started out really good with like, Force Awakens and Rogue One, like it was going great, but then Last Jedi happened and that divided people. And then uh Solo was a huge bomb. And then Rise of Skywalker was Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> I don't think I need ex- Ugh, that movie speaks for itself. And 
then after that, it was mainly just a bunch of Disney Plus shows. I mean, Mandalorian was good until it wasn't. Book of Boba Fett was a waste, a complete waste of time. Uh, Kenobi was a huge disappointment for a lot of people. Andor was good. And then recently you have Ahsoka, which is seen as kind of mid. So yeah, like this is, this is all Star Wars stuff. It's mainly been exclusively Star Wars. But still, it really, like, it, it tanked their reputation. So Indiana Jones had the deal with that. There's also the fact that the movie was so expensive. 300 million production budget. Like, seriously, what the hell is with these budgets? Why are they so high? They should not be this high ever. This should have been like 200 million budget. Like a 200 million budget, not 300. Because the higher the budget, the more money you have to make just to break even. And with a budget like that, like this movie needed to make more than Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which made a lot of money despite its reputation. It made a nice amount of cash. 300 million domestic, almost 800 million worldwide. That's great. So this movie needed to make more than that, pretty much, to make its money back. And boy, it didn't even make, like, half as much. Like, jeez. This movie opened with, like, $60 million. Which, compared to... Oh, uh, I gotta find it. Here. To Kingdom of Crystal Skull. It's so... It's so horrible. Cam of the Crystal Skull, that opened on a Thursday in, like, May of 2008. That had a five-day opening of $151 million because it was a holiday weekend. I mean, like, it made more, like... Like, Dial of Destiny's, like, it, in three days, it made about as much as Cam of the Crystal Skull made in, like, two. And then, as you can see here, like, in a week, it was about as much as Cam of the Crystal Skull made in three days. And, like, it's just, ugh. like, these numbers, they're so bad. So bad. Like, holy shit. <laughs> and, you know, like, that 60 million opening, I was like, that's it. It's dead. It's over. <laughs> it was over before it really, well, just as it started, like, it was over. And its legs weren't bad, especially compared to some other movies. Of this past summer, but only made like 174 million domestically. Like again, like going back. Oh, I went too far back. Shoot, going back to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Going back to that, like 174 million. Like Crystal Skull made made about that much in a week. A week. A week, man. Like, that is indefensible. That is so just straight awful. <laughs> and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull still had a really, this is, had a really lackluster reputation, and it still made that much money. Dollar of Destiny, it didn't even, it didn't even come close to that. And then worldwide, it made like $381 million. Like, that's, like, not even, like, that's nowhere near, like, two. Like, a two multiple. That's not even, like, it didn't make, like, you know, 1.5 times its budget. So this movie lost a shit ton of cash as a result, obviously. And it basically killed the series. Well, the movie was, the series was, this was supposed to be, like, the end of Indiana Jones. But, boy, what a pitiful ending. <laughs> like, like, I don't know why Harrison Ford agreed to even do this movie. Like, what they should have done, if they were going to continue Indiana Jones, they should have just rebooted it. Reboot it, put someone else there. I remember rumblings of, like, Chris Pratt being Indiana Jones, like, way back in the day. You know what? That would have been a better decision than this. <laughs> because, look, Harrison Ford, people like him, but nobody wanted to see 80-some-year-old Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. No one wanted that. That's just sad. And, yeah, just, ugh. <laughs> and the thing is, Disney kind of killed this movie, like, way in advance, because they screened this at Cannes, 
at the Cannes Film Festival and you think, oh, usually you do that if you know your movie's good and you want to get some good advanced buzz. That did not happen at all. The movie got really lackluster reviews. I'm just like, Disney, you killed the movie before it came out. What are you doing? <laughs> like, it just, like, that told me this movie was going to, this movie was going to be a, a, a bust. And it was, and its performance was beyond bust. So, yeah. Not shocked about this. I didn't even watch the movie. I did not care. I'm just like, I'm not, I don't want to watch this. And I didn't, and no one else did either. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And like Lucasfilm, I, it, like, eventually you're going to, you're, you're only going to have so many failures. Like the failures are going to stack up enough to where, they may just die completely because I, I refuse to believe. Like, I don't think they have much of a future outside of the Disney Plus shows they're making. Even then, those aren't in a great... Those aren't doing great. So, yeah. But I don't think we're going to see Indiana Jones again, ever. I think this is maybe like in 20 years as a shitty reboot or something. But, yeah. Indiana Jones, Dial of Destiny, huge disaster right there. It was a disaster I saw coming, like, several miles away. So, yeah. So that's the end of June, and now we move on to July, and my god, it it pains me, pains me to talk about this movie here, but I have no choice. And that's Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Okay. <sighs> This movie, I really thought, in my heart of hearts, I thought this movie would be an undisputed hit. And it had, like, no reason for it not to be, because of the Mission Impossible movies, ever since Ghost Protocol, they've gotten a really strong reputation. Well, like, Fallout considering, is considered, like, one of the best action movies of the 2010s. So, I thought that possible momentum would lead to Dead Reckoning Part 1 doing well, and there's also the fact that Tom Cruise's last movie, Top Gun Maverick, blew up at the box office. It just exploded. It became his biggest movie ever by a ridiculous margin. Made over seven hundred million domestically, which is a very rare feat. Like only like three other movies have done that. I think. Let me check. Uh, we'll have to like, find it. Shoot. I should be able to find it here. Top Gun, where are you? <laughs> Top Gun. Okay, look at Top Gun Maverick. Here you are. Look at this. 718 million domestic. 1.47 billion. The second biggest of the year domestic worldwide. The biggest of the year domestically last year. Did better than Avatar The Way of Water in the States. Which is a hell of a feat. Okay, it was four other movies, but still. The only movies that did better were the first Avatar, No Way Home, Endgame, and Force Awakens. So, this movie's indie and a very elite group in terms of box office performers. So, naturally, many people believed, including me, they thought, you know, the success of Top Gun Maverick would carry over to Dead Reckoning Part 1 because, you know, the Tom Cruise connection and everything. I thought that too. I thought this movie was going to make a billion dollars. I really did. It was like this and Guardians 3 like, where I thought those will make a billion. And neither of those came true. But at least Guardians 3, you know, got kind of close-ish. It was like four-fifths of the way there. <laughs> but this was like, it barely went halfway there. And, you know, just, I remember just looking at its box office as it was, you know, the movie was releasing. I saw its opening day, because it's open on Wednesday, opening day, and I was like, um, this is not what I thought was going to happen. This is not great. And then second day happened, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. What's, what is happening? What's going on? But then it recovered a bit over the weekend, but still 78 million for a five day Weekend. I thought it would made that much for the three-day weekend, honestly. 
But then I was like, you know what? Sure, this opening isn't great, but maybe this movie will have strong legs. Because the fact the last few Mission Possible movies had strong legs. This should have them too. This movie has great word of mouth, great reviews. Should have a long life. It did not. <laughs> it crumbled week two. Fell 65%. And on July 21st, that was, remember, that was the weekend Barbenheimer happened. So, yeah, had to deal with that. And then his legs were good, but at that point, it was, the damage was already done. It was over. <laughs> Nothing was going to save this movie. And it ended up making $172 million domestic, $567 million worldwide on a budget of $290 million. Here it is, another stupidly expensive movie. And compared to other Mission Possible movies, it does not look good. <laughs> like, at all. Like, domestically, it's the second worst after Mission Possible 3, which was already a disappointment. And I'm pretty sure in terms of actual ticket sales, it Dead Reckoning Part 1 is the worst. <laughs> and uh, worldwide, it only made more than the first three Mission Possible movies. I mean, about $100 million less than... Ghost Protocol, Rogue Nation, about two hundred million less than Fallout. So, yeah, it does not look good compared to its pre its predecessors. So, yeah, like I I don't know what well I know what went wrong. I know exactly what went wrong. It wasn't the movie's fault. It was mainly uh it was a victim of circumstance. Because, again, as I mentioned, July 21st, Barbenheimer happened. Now, if it was just Barbie, it probably would have survived that. Because both movies have very different audiences. But Oppenheimer, that killed it. Completely. That was the death blow. Because Oppenheimer's audience was too similar to Mission Impossible's audience. Not to mention Oppenheimer took away all of Mission Impossible's big screens, all of its IMAX screens and everything. So, Dead Reckoning Part 1 was screwed. It was fucked. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> so that's why it fell like 65%. But yeah, this really saddens me. Like, this is depressing. I really thought this movie would be a hit. And I remember seeing the movie, I thought it was really, really good. I was like, this movie deserves to be successful. And it refused to be successful. It was the polar opposite of The Flash, where I was rooting for that movie's demise. This, I rooted for it to succeed. And it didn't. And it broke my heart. So, yeah. yeah it's, it sucks that the movie underperformed. Now, I know this is going to be Dead Reckoning Part 2. It was already filmed. Well, it was mostly filmed. So, And this is supposed to be like the end of the series anyway. So, it's not, you can't really call it a franchise killer when the franchise was is pretty much about to end. So, like it was pre-planned to end with like... Dead Reckoning Part 2, which is supposed to come out next year, supposedly. <laughs> so, yeah. So, obviously, this was supposed to be the end of the series. So, it's not like they were going to make Mission Impossible 8, 9, 10. It's not like there was going to keep going. But this still hurts. It hurts because it deserved better. It deserved so much better than what it got at the box office. But maybe Dead Reckoning Part 2 will do better. It should. Like, looking at the 2024 calendar, there's no Oppenheimer, there's no Barbie, no Barbenheimer on the calendar or anything similar like that. So, Dead Reckoning Part 2, Dead Reckoning you know, Part 2 won't have to deal with that. But, yeah, Dead Reckoning Part 1 deserves so much better. And then we move on to the end of July, where I'm talking about Haunted Mansion, a movie that... Very much, it didn't deserve better. Like, it, well, it never had a chance to begin with, <laughs> honestly. Because, man, this movie, this had no buzz at all. I remember, like, no one was talking about it when it was coming out. No one cared. And I remember seeing, like, a trailer for this in front of both Oppenheimer and Barbie. And it was one of the most aggressively lame things I have ever seen. Like, I was so, I was just almost impressed by how just mid and how underwhelming it looked. Like, with all the talent on the screen, I was just like, 
this should be way better than it is, but it just looks so whatever. Like, like Disney, are you even trying anymore? Well, we know you're not trying, but come on. <laughs> so I knew things were going to go bad for this movie, and boy, did they go bad. Album of $24 million on a budget of hundred over $150 million. <laughs> So that's an automatic bomb. And it made like $66 million domestic, $107 million worldwide. It didn't even come close to its budget. So this is a huge L for Disney. And even compared to the, the last Haunted Mansion movie we got 20 years ago. Looking at that. Um, actually, wait, I'm pretty sure I can find it. Based off theme park, right? Where are you? Haunted Here we go. The Eddie Murphy version from 2003. That did better. And that cost like quite a bit less. But like this movie ended up... For some reason it got like a cult following down the line. I don't see that happening for the new version. I feel like most people forgot it existed already. So... Yeah, so the fact that Haunted Mansion 2023 couldn't even match Haunted Mansion from 2003. Like... Damn. <laughs> Just, wow. And it didn't even make as much as Jungle Cruise two years ago, which, uh, grant that had bigger stars, but that movie had to deal with Disney+. Plus, and it still did way better than this. So, yeah, like, yeah, I'm not shocked that the movie failed as hard as it did, because, again, no one cared for it. But, God, like, like stuff like this just makes you wonder, like, how much longer can Disney go with all these bombs? Like, like, it's only going to be a matter of time before things, like, really start to just crater, like, when they really just start to fall apart. I mean, one could argue that it's already happening. So, yeah, I don't think they can afford too many more bombs like this or bombs like, you know, Indiana Jones and Dial of Destiny. I don't think they can afford it. They really can't. So, yeah, Haunted Mansion, huge failure. Not surprised about that. Ugh. Now we got one more movie to talk about. And that is Blue Beetle. Ugh, boy. So, Blue Beetle had, had some of the same problems as The Flash. Because it's a DCU movie and because of the whole DCU announced it with James Gunn, Peter Saffron, made the movie worthless. Uh, from the get-go, worthless. Mean, meant nothing to nobody. And sure, like, they tried to position this, like, to try to make it, like, kind of, like, force it in to the DCU, but I knew what they were doing. I'm just like, you're just trying to make this movie more important so it doesn't fail so hard. Like, I know your game plan. <laughs> you're not fooling anybody definitely not fooling me but this movie had different problems than the flash because like the blue beetle character is c-list at best blue beetle was never really mainstream i don't know much about blue beetle i only really know him from injustice 2 and that's about it like most people don't even know who he is and sure that hasn't been a problem for like other superhero movies like guardians of the galaxy and ant-man you know those were made those were very much, those characters were very much not, nowhere near A-list. But Marvel, like the MCU, made you give a damn about them. It did a really, Marvel did a good job selling you on the characters. As a result, people watched those movies. DC, on the other hand, they, they did no such thing. <laughs> they kind of just were like, here's Blue Beetle. And and you're just like, well, what's you know Blue Beetle? What's a Blue Beetle? What? Why is he special? <laughs> What makes him special. And it's basically, oh, he's just like this guy who has like this armored suit. You know, so it's kind of like Iron Man. It's just... Like, so yeah. Ugh. So obviously the problem is Blue Beetle's not popular as a character. Not super popular as a character. Then you had, like, the cast was very lackluster. No big names attached to it. There's the fact that the movie came out in, like, late August. That's where movies go to die. Everyone knows August is, like, the worst month of all the summer months. Because you have, like, May, June, July. You got all these big movies come out. All these heavy hitters. And then August is just 
there. It exists. <laughs> That's in like releasing in late August. Like usually the big August movies come out the beginning of the month, not late in the month. <laughs> so yeah, that release date was just a bad decision. And then there's also the fact that superhero movies as a whole, they've been struggling, man, this year. This year has been rough for the genre. The only two hits we've had are Guardians 3 and Across the Spider-Verse. And funny enough, those are the two I had the most confidence in. But yeah, Ant-Man 3 was a buzz. Shazam 2, disaster. The Flash, disaster. Blue Beetle, disaster. <laughs> this is another one. Open with $25 million. Just $25 million. Its number is like worse than Morbius, Dark Phoenix, Green Lantern, Birds of Prey. Um, Fanforestic, I believe, did had a worse opening weekend. Had a better opening weekend than this. We should really tell you something because Fanforestic is one of the biggest catastrophes ever <laughs> for the genre. But it means legs haven't been too bad. It That's like the one thing I'll give it credit for. It didn't crumble as fast as Shazam 2 or The Flash. It had better legs than those movies. But but, but it didn't even matter. It's only been like $70 million domestically. $125 million worldwide on a budget of $120 million. Although apparently the number is $104 million. It doesn't matter. The numbers are fucking awful. <laughs> Absolutely dreadful. And it's the worst performing movie ever. For the DCU worldwide. Let me show you. Worldwide. Okay, worldwide. There we go. Right there at the bottom. Did worse than Shazam Fury of the Gods. Did worse than Wonder Woman 1984. And the Suicide Squad movies that... were That came out at a way worse time. For movies. With COVID and everything. Not to mention they were part of the HBO Max experiment. Like they were screwed going before what they got released blue beetle didn't have to deal with that problem and yet it still did worse <laughs> so like wow <laughs> wow so yeah um blue beetle like i just i knew this movie was gonna fail because there was also just a lack of, just a hardcore apathy surrounding the movie no buzz no energy I thought the reviews would help it, but because the reviews were actually pretty good, but they didn't help it at all, which you know proves that quality doesn't mean shit sometimes when it comes to movies or really anything. Because your your product could be really good, and still no one will care. <laughs> like quality is like quality sometimes it means nothing. So. Yeah, Blue Beetle, huge bust, huge bomb. DCEU is like 0 and 3 this year. And Aquaman, they still have Aquaman 2 in December. I feel like that's going to be a bomb too because like why would anyone care about that? So th I feel like they're going to be 0 and 4. This is going to be the most embarrassing year ever for DC. And like they better hope and pray that Superman Legacy m you know people really care about that. And makes money. I better hope this new DCU does well. It, it does. It goes over a lot better than the DCEU ever did. Because if it doesn't, then I don't know what they're gonna do. <laughs> so, yeah, and that's it for summer. That's it. I already covered all the rest of these movies. So yeah, summer is over. Thank God. <laughs> um, next year, like. Next summer is obviously because of the strikes, the writer strike, which is over, but still it, it it did its damage. It's done its damage. And the after strike, which is still going on, although that might end relatively soon because the negotiations are probably going to start next week for that to be resolved. Um, but still, I don't think the summer schedule we got is very much far from final. The furthest thing from final. I have to... Oh, this is like the rest of 2023. I have to... You know, I gotta go... Ugh, gotta find it. Release schedule. Where... Okay. Here's summer 2024. As of me making this video. Got Deadpool 3. 
My Ex Friend's Wedding, Furiosa, Garfield, If, Kingdom of the, the Planet of the Apes, Ballerina, The Watchers, Inside Out 2, Bad Boys 4, um, Horoscope, Mission Possible Dead Reckoning Part 2, Despicable Me 4, Mufasa the Lion King, Venom 3, Twisters, Captain America Brave New World, and then the rest of the August movies here, like Harold and the Purple Crayon, Borderlands, Alien Rhombolus, or the next Alien movie, and Craven the Hunter. That's what it looks like. And as I already mentioned, this is far from final. Those strikes are going to cause quite a few of these movies to leave. So, you know, but if, like, if this schedule, like, if it remains like this, and it won't, but even if it did, I feel like the best bet is, like, Deadpool 3. <laughs> you know, really, Deadpool 3 is the only one I'd really, really care about. I guess there's also Dead Reckoning Part 2, that as well. But the rest of the, I guess, Venom 3, kind of, but not really. But the rest, like, ah, uh, oh, it, it does not look good to me. It does, maybe my mind will be changed when I see trailers for these movies. But if Summer 2024 is looking rough right now, and I feel like it's only going to get, it's only going to get rougher <laughs> one, you know, when, when there will inevitably be like a bunch of delays and everything. But, yeah, that's it. So, that's it. That's all. Make sure to subscribe, like this video, leave a comment, turn on notifications, share the whole drill. Want we'll to check out more videos like this? Got playlists on the homepage, all previous uh, recap videos I made on the channel. You want to watch the previous two summer 2023 recaps I made, the part one, two, or any other ones I've done on the channel, you can go right ahead. There's also box office recaps where I go over the box office results for any particular month. Every movie I talked about in detail in this video, I made prediction videos for. So if you want to watch any of those prediction videos or any of the ones I've done on the channel, you can go right ahead. There's also the canceled series where I go over all the movies that are supposed to come out but didn't. I've now made 208 episodes. I know there's... I'm kind of holding off 209. I'm just... Ugh, the timing is just not on my side with that video, so I'm just going to wait until... There's like a good time to make it. But I have 208 ep episodes now. So if you want to watch any of them from beginning to now. I want to binge them all from beginning to now. I highly encourage you to do that. So go do it. And yeah, that's it. That's all. I am out. Goodbye.